Hello, and welcome to The Space Above Us, Episode 4, Project Mercury Flight 2, Liberty Bell 7, Space Flight and Seawater. Just a few short months after America's first human flight into space on Freedom 7, NASA was ready to replicate the feat. Mercury Redstone 4 would be piloted by Air Force test pilot Virgil Gus Grissom, and was planned to be nearly identical to Alan Shepard's Freedom 7 mission. Grissom dubbed his capsule Liberty Bell 7, since the small capsule reminded him of the well-known historical artifact. One engineer even used some white paint to depict a crack on the side of the spacecraft to mimic the famous defect in the actual Liberty Bell. Liberty Bell 7 was the fifth flight of the Mercury capsule Redstone missile combination, the previous flights being the bizarre and near-disastrous 4-inch flight of MR-1, MR-1A, which used the same booster and capsule as MR-1, the attention-grabbing flight of space chimpanzee Ham on MR-2, and of course Alan Shepard's flight aboard Freedom 7, officially known as MR-3. Grissom was among the three Mercury astronauts chosen as final candidates to be the first American in space, along with Alan Shepard and John Glenn. Glenn served as backup for both Shepard and Grissom while training for the suborbital Mercury Redstone 5 mission, which would eventually be scrapped in favor of the first manned orbital flight in Project Mercury. The overall mission plan was similar to Freedom 7, but the Mercury capsule for MR4 had a number of notable differences. The hatch on Freedom 7 had been manually operated using a hand crank. This was not only a slow process, which could be problematic in an emergency, but more importantly it meant that the door was heavy. Engineers were desperate to cut weight from the capsule wherever possible for the upcoming orbital flights, so they killed two birds with one stone by introducing an explosive hatch. Instead of the cranking system, the hatch was closed using 70 screws. Each screw had a hole drilled in it, which allowed it to shear away when a small explosive charge in the door was activated. A good way to visualize how the hatch, capsule, and explosive were assembled is to imagine a manhole cover with a thin layer of explosive applied to the inner lip of the hole. The hatch was placed on top of the explosive charge, which ran around the perimeter of the entrance of the capsule, and then all the screws were tightened to hold it in place. With one command from the capsule, the door would blast away, allowing for a rapid egress of the pilot. Crucially, the new hatch weighed only 23 pounds, as opposed to the 69 pounds of the mechanically operated hatch. 46 pounds may not sound like much, but when you need to accelerate it to 17,500 miles per hour, every bit of weight makes a difference. One of the chief complaints by the astronauts was the lack of any useful windows in the Mercury capsule. Alan Shepard was forced to make do with two small portholes placed at awkward angles and the periscope in his control console. Gus Grissom was to enjoy use of a new window placed in the center line of the capsule directly in front of the pilot. The outer pane of the window was made of Vicor glass, shaped to match the curvature of the capsule, and was capable of withstanding the intense temperatures of re-entry. Three interior planes, which were not curved, were placed behind the outer pane. Each pane was individually sealed to hold pressure. Lastly, there was normally a special filter layer on the inside pane that prevented a double image from appearing on the window, but it was not installed for this mission. By placing the window directly in front of the pilot, it allowed him to easily use the view outside as a reference point just by glancing above his control panel. Another significant change was the addition of a new control mode, the Rate Stabilization Control System, or thanks to NASA's deep-seated love of acronyms and initialisms, the RSCS. This system allowed the pilot to control the rate of rotation around each axis, instead of directly controlling the thruster firings. That meant that if the pilot moved the hand controller, the vehicle would start moving in the direction indicated at a rate proportional to the amount of hand controller movement. But if the controller was returned to the center neutral position, the vehicle would automatically cease rotating and hold the final attitude. This stands in contrast to the normal fly-by-wire or manual proportional systems, where the hand controller simply fired the thrusters. In that mode, if the pilot moved the hand controller and then returned to neutral, the vehicle would continue rotating in that direction until he stopped it by issuing a rotation in the other direction. Equal and opposite reaction and all that. The RSCS was intended for use during re-entry, but used a large amount of fuel so it was avoided by the astronauts and eventually removed from later flights. Other small changes included additional foam on the headrest, an improved booster capsule adapter ring, and a real-time position map. The foam and booster adapter were introduced in an effort to combat the vision problems Alan Shepard experienced during the buffeting of the vehicle as it approached and passed through Max-Q. 
The improved adapter would help reduce the buffeting, while the headrest foam would prevent conveying the additional vibration to the astronaut's head. The map, called the Earth Path Indicator, was a pretty nifty little instrument that showed the capsule's position on a small globe. It was intended to help the astronaut know when he was approaching various ground stations and aid in identifying landmarks. It was a remarkably simple device that allowed the astronaut to dial in his actual orbital inclination and orbital period, and then it would simply rotate the globe at an appropriate speed using clockwork mechanisms. It didn't have any direct way of actually knowing the spacecraft's position. I think the EPI was pretty cool, but it apparently wasn't all that useful, and even worse, it was heavy, so it was removed before the second orbital flight. It was especially not useful on the flight of Liberty Bell 7 since it wasn't even activated for the mission. The first several launch attempts had to be scrubbed due to unacceptable weather either at the launch site or in the expected landing zone. As July 21st dawned, however, everything was on track for an on-time liftoff. Astronaut Grissom was described as calm as he entered the capsule. The countdown was briefly held as pad technicians disabled some large searchlights in the pad area, which had caused issues with the telemetry during previous missions, and while cloudy conditions passed over the launch site. In a moment of foreshadowing, the launch was further delayed by a problem with the hatch. One of the launch pad technicians noticed that one of the 70 bolts fastening the hatch to the spacecraft was not properly aligned. After a 30-minute hold, Mission Control decided that the remaining 69 bolts would suffice for this mission. On July 21, 1961, at 7.20 a.m., the Redstone missile at last sprang off the launch pad, carrying Liberty Bell 7 and its single occupant skyward. The capsule communicator, Capcom, for this mission was the previous flight's pilot, Alan Shepard. Shepard teased Grissom over the radio, saying, Loud and clear, Jose, don't cry too much, with Grissom responding, Okie doke. The flight proceeded much the same as Mercury Redstone 3, with Grissom similarly impressed at the smoothness of the initial takeoff. Vibrations and buffeting did increase as the vehicle approached and passed through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, but were greatly diminished thanks to the new capsule adapter and headrest foam. Grissom reported that the transition from blue sky to black happened more suddenly than expected. Two minutes and 22 seconds after liftoff, the booster shut down. Grissom said that during the transition from the high accelerations of the boost phase to the weightlessness of ballistic flight, he had a strong sensation of tumbling and momentary disorientation. While this disorientation was not ideal, the astronaut had trained thoroughly and expected such a moment may occur, and was thus able to recover quickly. Ten seconds after BECO, which is the cool NASA way of saying booster engine cutoff, the capsule separated from the launch vehicle, and the small posigrade rockets attached to the rear of the spacecraft fired to push it away. The procedure differed slightly from that of Mercury Redstone 3, and that the posigrade rockets were fired directly into the booster adapter, since engineers had determined that this would cause a pop gun effect, imparting an additional 4 meters per second of velocity. For the flight of Freedom 7, the posigrade rockets were not fired until the capsule had drifted a distance away from the booster. As the vehicle automatically began the turnaround maneuver, Grissom looked for the booster through his window, but wasn't able to spot it. Like Freedom 7, this was a short suborbital hop, so there was no time to waste. Astronaut Grissom began his planned spaceflight activities immediately. He switched the vehicle over to the manual proportional control mode. To recap a bit from last time, the manual proportional mode used direct mechanical linkages between the pilot's hand controller and valves and small rocket thrusters placed around the capsule to affect attitude control. The more the pilot moved the control stick from the center, the more the valve would open, and thus the more the thruster would thrust, up to a maximum of 24 pounds of thrust. What's especially cool about the manual proportional system is since it was all mechanical, it didn't even need electricity to operate. Grissom first exercised pitch control, which again is similar to a yes nodding motion of your head, but overshot the desired angle. He found the controls to be sluggish and needed time to damp out the oscillations from the overshoot. He next tried yaw, a motion similar to a no side-to-side -side motion of your head, but found that too was slow to respond. Enough time had passed wrestling with his spacecraft that Grissom decided to omit exercising the roll controls in order to stay on schedule. It was later determined that the sluggish response was due to loose coupling of the mechanical linkages that connected the thrusters to the hand controller. The situation was similar to driving an old car, where you had to keep moving the steering wheel back and forth just to go in a straight line. Too much play in the system, and precise control is impossible. 
Next in the schedule was a trial of the new rate command system. The astronauts switched the RSCS on and was happy to discover their controls were much more responsive, but burned fuel at a high rate. This was not a large concern at the time, since the rate stabilization control system was mostly intended for use during re-entry, so a higher fuel usage shouldn't pose a problem. As I mentioned before, however, once NASA started performing the longer orbital missions, the high fuel usage was deemed too excessive to be practical, and the system was removed. Throughout these exercises, Grissom found it somewhat difficult to not be distracted by the view outside his centerline window. He radioed down, It's such a fascinating view out the window, you just can't help but look out that way. To which Alan Shepard responded, I understand. One of only two other humans on Earth who truly could. Already, it was time to begin the retro fire sequence. All three retro rockets fired without incident, and the retro pack jettisoned, leaving the heat shield exposed. Grissom later commented that up until that point in the flight, he had the sensation that he was moving backwards, since his back was facing into the direction of flight but that after retrofire, he had the sensation of flying forwards again, back towards Florida. While Grissom was trained enough to understand that of course this was not the case, it was another example of how the realm of spaceflight could cause strange sensations and disorientation in even the most seasoned of test pilots. As the capsule continued along its trajectory, the forces of reentry started to build up. Grissom later said that the direct sunlight was strong enough that if he hadn't been looking at the 0.05G indicator light used to alert the astronaut to impending re-entry forces, he likely would not have noticed it due to the glare. The brief re-entry phase passed with no issues, as the astronaut continued to radio down his impressions, even as he passed 10 Gs of deceleration. The drogue chute deployed at 21,000 feet, and the main parachute deployed at 12,300 feet. The pilot noticed a small tear in the parachute, but it did not spread, and the descent continued with no problems. During his descent, Grissom was in radio contact with recovery forces located in the expected landing zone. Splashdown occurred at 7.36 a.m., a mere 15 minutes and 37 seconds after launch. After the capsule righted itself, Grissom disconnected his helmet from his suit but left it in place, and loosened several of the straps restraining him to his seat. He also took the prudent step of checking the neck dam, which is a piece of material that pressed up against the astronaut's neck so water wouldn't fill the suit, in case he had to make a quick exit into the ocean. The recovery forces arrived at the splashdown site within a few minutes, but the astronaut asked them to stand by as he recorded the position of various switches and made a few notes. Notes complete, he asked the helicopter to move in for the recovery, pulled the safety pin from the control for the explosive hatch, and laid back to wait. Suddenly, there was a dull thud, and water started rushing into the capsule. The escape hatch on the side of the vehicle had blown away. Seawater entered the hatch as the spacecraft bobbed around. Grissom quickly removed his helmet and scrambled out of the flooding capsule. The pilot of the Prime Recovery Helicopter saw the capsule flooding with water and made to continue his recovery run. At first, this may seem a little misguided, since Grissom was floating right there and potentially in need of assistance, but water landing exercises had been performed plenty of times before, and the astronauts were happy to float around in the pleasant Florida water. Meanwhile, the spacecraft and its vital data was sinking right now. The helicopter moved in, the co-pilot successfully looped the recovery cable through the mount on top of the capsule, and the recovery helicopter began to slowly extract it from the ocean. Meanwhile, Gus Grissom was in trouble. During his hasty egress, he had neglected to close a valve on his spacesuit, and it was flooding with seawater. He was floating lower and lower in the water as he watched the primary recovery helicopter focus on Liberty Bell 7. Thankfully, he soon caught the attention of the pilot of the second helicopter. A lifeline was lowered to Grissom, who wrapped it around himself backwards, eager to get out of the water as soon as possible. The astronaut was safe, but his spacecraft was not as fortunate. Straining under the additional weight of the flooded capsule, the recovery helicopter engine began to fail. The helicopter pilot soon decided to cut the cable, ensuring they lost only one vehicle that day. Liberty Bell 7 disappeared beneath the waves and sank to the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. Once safely on board the recovery ship, Grissom was described as extremely tired, but insisted on proceeding with the debriefing. The big question hanging over the debriefing was obviously what went wrong with the explosive hatch. Did the hatch blow due to a malfunction? Did the astronaut mistakenly hit the button to jettison it? Did he panic and try to get out of the capsule immediately without considering the consequences? Despite what certain, in this podcaster's opinion, vastly overrated films may depict, 
Grissom was cool, calm, and in control in the moments after his splashdown. There was no reason to panic, and Grissom was, in fact, calmly awaiting the recovery forces when the hatch inexplicably blasted away from the capsule. There are two ways to activate the explosive charge in the hatch. The first was the method available to the astronaut. Near the astronaut's right arm was a knobbed plunger, which I think means a big button, that was held in place with a safety pin. Once the safety pin was removed, the button could be depressed with 5 or 6 pounds of force to activate the hatch. Even with the safety pin in place, however, the plunger could be actuated with a force of around 40 pounds. The second method was by using a lanyard on the exterior of the capsule. The lanyard was concealed behind a small panel that was able to be removed by a rescuer in case the astronaut was incapacitated. For this flight, the lanyard was held in place by only a single screw. The truth behind what activated the explosive hatch may never be known with complete certainty. There are various theories ranging from those that were fictionalized for the sake of drama in a Hollywood film, that Grissom panicked and hit the plunger, to the somewhat plausible but unlikely, that Grissom simply hit the plunger by accident, to what I consider to be the most likely cause, a loose external lanyard. One interesting thing to note is that when later astronauts purposefully depressed the plunger to blow the hatch after their missions, they all received a superficial hand injury in the process, an injury Grissom did not receive. Despite the loss of the spacecraft, the mission was a success in all other objectives. Between the two suborbital flights, all four control modes, automatic, fly-by-wire, manual proportional, and rate stabilization, had all been successfully tested. The capsule and life support systems had performed as expected, and now the program had experienced and safely handled its first emergency situation. One comment made by both pilots was that they found the various simulators to be extremely useful. Between the procedures trainer, which allowed them to practice operating the spacecraft controls through a simulated mission, the air-lubricated free attitude trainer, a massive mechanism that resembled a giant gyroscope and allowed the pilots to practice the controls with realistic corresponding movements, and others, they felt adequately prepared for their space flights. Another note made by both pilots was that participating in the spacecraft checkout activities at the launch site was especially important. The astronauts spent a lot of time in various simulators, but when they were involved with spacecraft checkout, they were able to get to know their actual specific spacecraft. Each craft had its own idiosyncrasies and quirks. The panel layout was different, the set of instruments on board was different, and there were several other small changes. Grissom said, quote, It is good to get into the flight capsule a number of times. Then on launch day, you have no feeling of sitting on top of a booster ready for launch. You feel as if you were back in the checkout hangar. This is home. The surroundings are familiar. You are at ease. You cannot achieve this feeling of familiarity in the procedures trainer because there are inevitably many small differences between the simulator and the capsule. Given the success of the two piloted Mercury Redstone suborbital flights, NASA decided it was time to move on to the big prize, orbital flight. Of course, the fact that shortly after the flight of Liberty Bell 7, Soviet cosmonaut German Titov spent an entire day in orbit could have had something to do with that decision. One quick note, if you look at the podcast feed, you'll see that, like last time, I've made available the entire air-to-ground communications audio of Liberty Bell 7 as a supplemental. So if you're interested, go have a listen. This will have to be the last time I include the audio for an entire mission due to the increasingly long duration, but I'll see if I can't find some good opportunities for future radio audio use. Thanks for listening to The Space Above Us. As always, feel free to send any questions, comments, or other feedback to jp at thespaceabove.us or via Twitter at the username at spaceaboveus or on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash thespaceaboveus. I'm not a big fan of podcasts that spend a lot of time on self-promotion, so you won't hear this from me too often, but if you are so inclined, rating and subscribing on iTunes would be a big boost. The Space Above Us was accepted on iTunes last week, and I've been told that early ratings and subscriptions can make a substantial difference. So if you're enjoying the podcast and want to help get the word out so others can enjoy it as well, please head on over to iTunes. Self-promotion over. I'll see you in two weeks for the flight of Friendship 7, an American arrives in orbit. Ad Astra, catch you on the next pass.